Pleasure to be joined now by a, a very important member of the Hamilton Tiger Cats who had a big part, as always, in shaping what the draft looked like in 2021. He is Drew Alamang, uh, and he is the Senior Director of Personnel and Co-Manager of Football Operations. Drew, you can be honest with me. I've never been able to ask you this before. Do, do you wish you had a simpler title? Do we wish we had something that wasn't so damn wordy? Um, yeah, maybe. I, I usually <laughs> just tell people I work for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. There you go. And, uh, kind of leave it at that. Um, that's, that's all you need. It's a, uh, it's a great job by you guys again on the draft class this year. And I, I am going to get to Jake Bird and some of the other picks that you had and kind of your thinking behind it. Um, but I do want to ask you because this would typically after the CFL draft, everybody would be headed off to Quebec city or to Ottawa or Montreal. And it would be East West bowl week, right? And it would be an opportunity to see kind of what's coming down the pipe for 2022 in the draft. And I'm wondering which part of the evaluation process have you missed the most or the one that's been tweaked that you, it just doesn't feel quite the same because of COVID because there's so many different things from the combine in person to in-person interviews to the East West bowl and beyond that has changed. And for you as somebody who this is your life, this is your passion and your work. What is the the element that you've looked at and been like, man, that, if I could have one thing, I wish this was it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've, I've never, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely been different these, uh, the, the way we've done even really the, the past two drafts. Um, but I mean, I, I think you kind of ad adapted and, you know, every team was kind of in the same boat. Um, you know, I think personally, I really enjoyed the East West, um, you know, kind of, you were coming out of a very difficult, uh, you know, just a busy time of year. And, you know, you got to kind of, you were excited about your draft and then you kind of got, got a firsthand look on what, what the next year's draft was going to be like. I mean, it, it didn't include every player that was going to be in that draft, but it was a good head start. And, and um, you know, you kind of were able to assess and, and, and meet some of these players for the first time and kind of know what you're getting into um, come uh, the next uh, scouting season. So, you know, maybe I would go with that. You know, I think there's probably pieces from every, um, part of the scouting process that, that you maybe uh, miss. But I mean, I think we've also learned that there's some some newer ways of doing things that are sometimes more efficient. Yeah, it feels like the, uh, this, the sped up process of how to reach people in different ways to, to scout and evaluate might have changed a little bit because of things being tweaked, as you say. But um, I'm also wondering, too, because you mentioned the East West is you're kind of, there's almost a bit of a detox. I've always had this feel when you're there, whether it's with U sports people or CFL people, that it feels like one of the most, not necessarily relaxed, I don't think is the right word, but it almost feels like a, a lower stress environment because you just went through such craziness with the draft and you get to wherever that game is being played, you get to practices and everybody's just happy to be around the field but there's not that immediate pressure of having to make decisions. It's okay. Let's get a sense for the room and who is here. Is it fair to say that the mood at East West is just, it's different than a lot of other events that you attend? Yeah, I think, I think for the evaluators and, and even, um, even the coaches that are there, whether it's the CFL or the U sport coaches, you know, I think it's somewhat relaxed, but maybe the players would, would say differently. You know, I know they're, they're pretty excited about it and, and also a little bit stressed out about, you know, that's kind of their first, first time performing, uh, right. One of say scouts, but I think generally they're, they're excited just to be there, but, uh, no, I think it is that, I think it's a time to kind of, you know, I think, I, I think we're all fairly close, even though we're, we're, um, the, the various CFL teams, we compete against each other. I think, you know, you kind of have a peer or multiple peers on each team team that you're somewhat, close with and, and respect a lot. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's always exciting to kind of connect with them and, you know, get their thoughts on, on the draft and, you know, you learn from them and how they see the game. And, and, um, you know, I think also just being around the U sports coaches, um, you know, have a lot of respect for, for every one of them and, and have got to know them fairly well over the years from, you know, there's now, some of them that we evaluated as players that are now fairly prominent <laughs> and some coaches that have been, you know, head coaches since I kind of started in it. So you've developed a, a relationship. So it's, it's nice to kind of see them and, and kind of get their initial thoughts on, on say the new draft class or, or even uh, the previous year's draft class. 
Who's the uh, the U Sports coach that pulls your leg to draft his guys more than anybody? <laughs> um, I don't know. They're very respectful about that. Um, you know, I think it. it uh, I don't know. That's. Uh, I don't think any of them really do that. Um, okay. But um, they definitely. Uh, you know, they when you draft your player, I would uh, one of their players. I think each of them kind of reach out and, and kind of uh, congratulate you and, you know, let you know how, how well uh, of a job you just did on picking one of their players. Um, so I think they're very, they're <laughs> very uh, respect, respectful not to oversell one of their players, but uh, you know, I think we do have a really good relationship where we get a lot of uh, great information from, from, from each coach, um, you know, about their players and, and everything. So. Yeah, and those relationships obviously are so key to understanding kind of the all-encompassing view of the guys that you are are looking to select. And we'll get to who you select in just a second, but I do I want to ask you here because I think a lot of people, as you said off the top, I just tell people I work for the Thai Cats. Everybody that cares about the Thai Cats knows your name, and I think everybody understands what you do, regardless of the long job title. They understand that yeah, you help build the team, and you've been involved in Canadian scouting, and you work with the draft, and you do pro days, and all of these things that are part of the job. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people understand your journey into player evaluation and and holding the role that you do with the Thai Cats today. And I don't mean, you know, bouncing through the various levels necessarily of job titles and making your way up the ladder to where you are today, but just your actual origins of getting into football and scouting and, and player development or recognition. Can you tell people where this journey began for you? Yeah, it's uh, maybe uh, I try to try to summarize it. Um, but, uh, no, I think it was something of an interest from, from a young age. Um, you know, I think I was fortunate, uh, enough to have, uh, a father and a, an uncle that played in the CFL. So, you know, I kind of was around it from very, very young. And I think when my dad, uh, stopped playing, um, you know, I was able to kind of still, be a part of it just with friends that were at different points of their careers. So, you know, I'd get to go to practice a lot. You know, I think sometimes in my, you know, my early teens, like I'd go to Tiger Cats practice, you know, two or three times a week even. Um, so I think I started to, to develop like an interest in, in scouting and the different types of players from there. And, you know, I think it was just trying to, trying to find a way into um, scouting that took some time. Um, you know, it's uh it's not always the easiest thing to get into. So um, I initially started with the team um, in equipment, um, which was, uh, you know, a great experience. I learned a lot, you know, just not only about the, the, the football operations end and the equipment end, but also just kind of about the locker room and, you know, different dynamics and the types of players that, that, that you want to kind of have a nice um, culture in a way. Um, so I think, um, it was great from that sense. And then I also learned a lot, you know, about coaching and, and running a practice and, you know, helping set up different drills for the coaches and things like that. So it was a really good education from that sense. Um, and then from there, I kind of worked into the football operations. Um, and, you know, I kind of just kept on going along that path a little bit. And I think the whole time I, I would kind of through the different different people I worked with kind of learn a little bit. Uh, some different things about scouting, whether it was from coaches or, or uh, you know, Bob Obilovich or, or Dan Rambo, different people that worked in, in personnel. Like, I think I kind of learned different things from, from everyone, um, you know, and had a lot of uh, fortunate uh, experiences that I kind of was able to, to, to keep um, kind of progressing in, into more of a personnel role over some time. Was there a, a seminal moment for you where something, you know, a switch flipped and you went from, yeah, I really like football and I go to practices and it's fun to be around the game to, oh, I actually feel like I can do this. And I, and I like this specific part. Cause I mean, football, as you know, as well as anybody drew is a, is a big world. There's a lot of things and a lot of different aspects of an organization. When you zeroed in on this aspect of it and said, I want to work in scouting, was there a moment that it clicked for you or was it just over time a progression? Uh, yeah, I think it was probably a little bit over time. Um, but, you know, I think there was like a moment where you just kind of decided to, to kind of go for it and kind of go all in and, and, you know, take some, some risks, uh, 
you know, to, to do it. But, um, you know, I kind of was determined in a way to, to try to, to find a way. And, you know, I, I think I was, uh, I was fortunate. I, I had some unique experiences along the way that kind of, that helped me progress. Um, you know, I think everyone, you know, you sometimes benefit from a bit of luck at times. Um, but, um, you know, I, re I think I'd wanted to do it and then I just kind of went all in and, and made an attempt at, at doing it. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't, um, you know, I, I definitely kind of had to learn some different things on the fly, but, uh, it, it, um, you know, it's been, been a great journey. I, I don't think I would change anything on how it, how it's kind of progressed. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's, again, you've been putting together these drafts for a while now, as you say, going all the way back to scouting some guys that are now involved in U sports coaching staffs, which I love because I'd love to get a full breakdown of scouting reports on guys that you're now handling, uh, talking to going into it. But uh, the the number one overall pick this year uh, is Jake Bird officially listed as tight end, obviously out of Boston College. If you're a CFL fan, and you didn't know that you're under a rock at this point. Uh, but I think a lot of people myself included, honestly, Drew, when he pops up, I'm thinking that it's, well, he just became eligible and they have to scramble and get ready and find out as much as they can. You guys had already done scouting on him because you were planning on him being available in the previous year's draft, correct? In the 2020 draft? Yeah. Um, I think initially um, we kind of have for our personnel department, we have different areas for the U.S. that we kind of cover. And, right. and part of my area is the the Ma Massachusetts area. So I had gone to Boston college, um, Jake's, uh, it would have been his, his senior year's training camp. And so you kind of learn, you know, they, that when you go to a school, they, they, you definitely get background information on, on every senior. And he was a player that the NFL was looking at. Um, so I did have quite a bit of information then. Um, but at that, that time, you know, I didn't know he was Canadian. Um, and uh, I think it was shortly after um, that we started to hear about him as potentially being a Canadian. Um, you know, you didn't know for sure. Um, um, there was kind of, you know, just, you didn't know, you know, without talking to him, you didn't know for sure. But I think as that year kind of went on and, and then after his senior year, I think he started to understand that he was going to be uh, a Canadian, but he didn't end up putting his name in the draft until, until this, this, this past year, um, this previous draft that obviously we just went through, like, I don't know exactly when he did, but, um, you know, we found out, you know, not, you know, a month before the draft kind of thing. Um, I forget the exact dates, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a, a lot of time, but we had kind of known about him and you kind of stay, you know, stay up with it and, and refresh yourself on his film. And, um, you know, so I think we were, and, and not just us, I think a number of teams, um, if not all teams kind of knew of him and, you know, just were waiting for the go ahead um, from the league that he'd been officially approved. Um, so, you know, it was definitely uh, exciting once, once that happened. Yeah. You, uh, you should have known as soon as you heard the Regina accent, Drew. I mean, come on. As soon as you, you talk to him at Boston, no, I'm just kidding at Boston college practice, but <laughs> it, it's so amazing to me, the idea that you go to these places across the NCAA and yeah, you're evaluating players all over the place because they might be mini camp. Uh, the guys that you bring in, they might be a training camp. It might be a tryout or a, there's all these different ways that you accrue talent. And the idea that you go to these places and you don't know necessarily that that guy is, is has connections that are legitimate to Canada. And then when you do find out, what is that moment like for you? Because I imagine that happens all over the place where you're somewhere and somebody says, yeah, you know, mom was from Montreal. They just mentioned it in passing. And you're like, sorry, come again. It, you're like, that's kind of important to us. That changes a lot of our evaluation and how much emphasis we're going to put on looking at this person. Yeah, no, it's definitely happened. Uh, happened before where you're at a school and you'd never heard of this player. And, you know, they, they, they just kind of their initial, the, what they call a pro liaison their they'll go through the players kind of background with you um, before you start to talk to other um, references at the school. And, and usually the initial background they'll, they would include something uh, you know, he's a Canadian citizen or, you know, something to that effect. And it has happened before you've never heard of this player and, and um, you know, sure enough, uh, 
you know, he's, he is on your radar at that point and, and it kind of works its way up through the league and, and everything. But uh, no, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely when it happens. I wouldn't say it happens a lot, um, but you know, it's definitely happened before. Yeah. And I, I imagine that when you have that moment, <laughs> do you get on the phone right away and call Sean Burke? Do you, do you let somebody else like, do you, how quickly does that turn around where you go? Uh, listen, we just had something happen here. Uh, Jake Burt's actually probably going to be eligible for this Canadian draft. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's different. I mean, sometimes when you do hear about it from a, a school in one of those building, uh, one of those uh, initial um, meetings, you maybe you know suggest to the the pro liaison that you know they get in contact with someone from the league. Um, like, there's no real benefit for us to only know about about right. it. Um, you know, so at least help the player out um, when his senior year is done. I mean, he'll have an option to to maybe play in the CFL. So we just kind of usually get the contact information to to the pro liaison and and let them take care of it. Like it's best that we don't kind of interact with the NCAA player on that level where we're helping them do something like that. But if we, you know, give it to the pro liaison, they can kind of take care of it, everything like that for, you know, at the right right time for that player. So right that's typically how we we handle it and and uh and and kind of uh and then once they're you start doing your work on the player but once they're officially um included in the draft that's maybe when you start to kind of reach out to the player and do your your interviews with them and things like that i could get uh, bogged down in the mud forever on you on logistics questions but let's actually ask you some stuff about jake and what you saw from him when you were scouting and when you were trying to figure out what his game was all about and specifically also how it applies to the CFL, to Tommy Condell's offense, to the Hamilton Tiger Cats that you're working for? What did you see and what do you imagine him as moving forward? Yeah, no, we were excited about him. I mean, we think obviously that, you know, he's played tight end. So there's some different things from a, you know, a blocking time, uh, standpoint that he can do from an inline perspective. And, and also, um, you know, we view him as being pretty athletic, um, uh, in terms of his play speed and, and ability to, you know, get a little bit of separation and ability to, to get open, whether it's, you know, just through his route details and, and the ability to catch the football, you know, so we think he can do some different things from a receiving standpoint. Um, you know, so um, I think, you know, once we get him in house and, and Tommy starts to work with him and, and the other, you know, we have another really talented tight end in, in Nikola Kalinic. Um, you know, I think we have used a tight end, you know, this past year. Um, you know, and I think um, Tommy's excited to kind of work with both of them and kind of see where the role progresses for, for each of them, really, in the offense. That was actually my first thought uh, after the drafting was that the Bash brothers, for some reason, was the first thing that came into my mind. Just two big, strong dudes that are, can do a bunch of, of different things. And I was imagining because I, immediately I start looking at heights and weights and I go, OK, Nicola's in there at around like 6'4", 6'5", 250, 255, I think is what he's listed on in the Ticats website. And then I look at Jake and I go, OK, he's an inch, maybe an inch and a half, two inches shorter and he's got great length and yeah, he creates a little bit more separation and maybe he's a little bit quicker off the ball. He's maybe got more pure hands, but I'm going the pair of them, the opportunities to use them in the backfields and also in the way that the CFL has evolved, right? Where there's so much play action and flipping to the flats and backside tight end screens and tunnel screen. I mean, there's so much stuff you can do with those two body types. Is there not? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's, it'd be up to, 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 Tommy and his his staff on how he wants to use them but I know he's kind of he's got some different ideas and, and things like that uh, you know f- from an offensive standpoint so I think it's it's exciting to to kind of see and you know also um, they're both uh, players that, that can can add value to us on special teams um, you know so I think we're we're excited to, to have both of them the idea of the hybrid tight end, if you want to call it that, I'm not sure what you guys call it or coaches that you talk to call it or how Tommy calls it. But to me, I just call him a hybrid because to me, it's like you're taking that, that big body that typically has been that hand on the ground inline blocker that's mauling people and once in a while catching a, you know, a six yard hook. Now you've got all these guys in the NFL and in the NCAA that are roaming around, standing up, splitting out, still doing all the physical things, but getting opportunities in different places. 
Do you think the value of the hybrid tight end, that sort of big slot in the CFL, if you want to call it, that can also be more of a tight end by traditional nature is actually rising for you as somebody who's evaluating talent and seeing the way that these trends kind of ebb and flow over time. What do you think of that position specifically? Cause I saw like Bruno Lobel this year, obviously from Cincinnati that goes to the riders in this draft and you guys take Jake bird. And I'm, I'm thinking about the way that this is trending. And I'm wondering if this is not going to be one of those consistent things in the CFL increasingly that we see. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, there's been, uh, I think a lot of offense coordinators would, would like to have a player like that and, and, and then be able to develop a, you know, various game plan using them. Um, but I think, I think it's always, there hasn't always been that, that type of player right. in the draft you know, for whatever reason, maybe they've, you know, just predominantly stayed as a receiver or, you know, maybe they've, they've uh, played, you know, just a different position altogether, but it just seems, uh, you know, this past year and, and some other years, there's been that one player that's maybe kind of come through, um, you know, that we happen to have, you know, two on our team now in, and I guess the span of three drafts, um, you know, and then there was another one in this draft that's very talented too. Um, you know, so I, I think they haven't come along in numbers, you know, but I, I think every team, you know, would like to have a player that can do those different, different types of things, you know, also, you know, have size and physicality and can block people, but also can, can, um, you know, run routes and, 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 you know, have ball skills and, and, and everything like that. I think they're, they're sometimes harder to find. They're not as, maybe not as used, um, across college football in Canada as much. So maybe that's one reason why the, the player doesn't, doesn't come through the draft all the time. It's, it's tough to say exactly why it hasn't happened, but um, this draft, I mean, you definitely saw, you know, a, two or three guys that are in that mold. Do you believe that they, they, they will become more available, that that type of player is going to become more prominent as the, the position continues to evolve and people stop thinking of tight ends as, tight ends and stop thinking of slots as slots they start thinking of if you're big and you can run and you can be physical we can put you in that spot is there a potential in your eyes seeing how junior football evolves and amateur football that this becomes something that continues to grow and all of a sudden we're seeing more of them in the draft yeah i could see that um you know sometimes uh you know there'll be a situation like that where a young player will kind of see someone that that's you know, ahead of them, that's, that's playing a certain way and they might kind of follow that, that path. And, you know, maybe in a, another decade, they would have, you know, transitioned to, you know, say a defensive end or something. Um, You know, um, there's been other players in the draft over the years that maybe, you know, had been a tight end and say high school, but they've, they transitioned more into a defensive end role for whatever reason um, or linebacker role. Um, you know, so I think sometimes, yeah, when they, they have that, that person that, that they're watching at the pro level, you know, do something that, that they really want to do, they might continue on that path and, you know, say in this case, develop as a tight end. So I could see it for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, where would you have, have prioritized Jake Bird if he were in the 2020 draft? Uh, that was another thought that I had after the draft had concluded where I'm looking back at it and thinking, well, if he actually would have come out in 2020, and everybody liked him this much, I wonder, A, how high he would have gone, and B, what attempts you guys would have made to try and get him. Yeah, I don't know. That's, I've never really thought of it that way, but um, I think he, he would have been well, you know, thought of in, in you know, what, whatever draft, really. So um, I think, you know, we had uh, – we, we didn't go as far – down the, the road and having him ranked because he wasn't going to be in the draft. We right. knew kind of they, they it's about 30 days before the draft date where they have like a final list that comes through. And, you know, we hadn't really put him in our, our final rankings or anything like that, but I, I would think he would have been for any team kind of near, near the top of things. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I think he was pretty well thought of across the league in a way. Um, so um, I think we would have been, you know, excited about him last year, but also, you know, excited with how it worked out and the players that we got in, in last year's draft too. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a talented group that you guys have in coming in, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. The the other thing that I wondered about when I read up on his kind of his history and his production and also his injury history was he had a couple of ACL tears. And I was talking about this with Derek Taylor from Saskatchewan. I think it was last week, two weeks ago, it just came up in conversation about the value of a major knee injury or an ACL tear feels different to us as guys in media than it used to. You guys to see somebody with an ACL and you go, oh man, I don't know. You know, Achilles is another one of those, man. I don't know. What is the value? How much does that hurt somebody's draft stock now based on the ways that the way they deal with these things has changed? The recovery time seems quicker. It seems like uh, the re-injury rate is, has gone down over time as well. Because when I saw that on his, it's like that, well, that would have been a red flag. It feels like a decade ago. And now it's just a note on his overall player uh, profile. Yeah, I think, um, you know, every player's, I think in every injury is probably a little bit differently, but I mean, his were a number of years ago when he's played, you know, kind of a number of years of football since then. And, right. you know, I think, you know, we did some, uh, due diligence with it and everything. And then I'll, I'll, I think also just talking, you know, to the player and, 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 you know, seeing what their plan is like, you know, on how they rehabbed at the time and just how the injuries even, even happen, like the time period of it, you can kind of build out, you know, what happened and, and everything like that. So I think every situation is a little bit differently, but I mean, there's a lot of players that you deal with in, in the draft that have had some sort of major uh, injury like that. And, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, I think there's an interesting part with that goes along with having a major injury is, you know, it's sometimes that point where the player kind of realizes like, I need to do this, this, and this better. And, you know, and in some sense, it's like, it's maybe changed their career, Um, you know, like in terms of, their prehab and, and mo- mobility programs that they do. And so I think there it's, you can, you can probably go one or two ways at that point. Like it can, it can either affect you for the worse or, or it's something you learn from and, and become a much better player and potential professional from. So I think a lot of the players that we, you know, it's, it's sometimes rare that you deal with a player that's, you know, had, had no injury history. No. Um, so but that being said, I mean, you still kind of do your your diligence, due diligence and try to figure out, you know, what happened and, and kind of, you know, you prefer that there's been, you know, it doesn't always work this way, but some sort of you've had the injury and then there's, you know, you've had the ability to see them at least back out there moving since that that injury or those injuries. Yeah. And that well, that takes me to Nick Cross as well that you took uh, being at the the ninth pick where. He's dealing with a knee injury as well, and that's affected him more recently, but that didn't scare you guys away from him. And, and specifically, the way that he played being so fast and physical and violent and a striker, and he just gets to the ball so quickly. When I watched him, Drew, I thought, well, this might be a free safety, but I don't know how you guys see him. And I'm always intrigued because I remember sitting next to Ken Austin and Eric Tillman when Kay Okafor got drafted. I'm like, wow, what a great pass rusher. And they're like, yeah, he's going to be a tackle. I'm like, okay, yeah, I didn't see that one coming. And he's been very good for you guys. So when you take Nick Cross, what is the thought process initially? Yeah, I mean, um, we're excited to, to get Nick. I mean, he's predominantly really been, uh, like most of his career, a, a Sam linebacker. Um, so, you know, we do think, you know, there, you know, maybe, yeah, he can do some different things as a safety. Um, but, you know, we're going to get him in and, and kind of see what he can handle. Um, from, you know, maybe it's, you know, down the road initially, it could be, um, you know, he's got a linebacker role where, you know, he comes in on passing downs or something. So, you know, we're going to kind of see what he can, he can handle. Um, we know he's an impactful special teams player. He's, he's done that, um, you know, and, um, he's got a lot of, tr- uh, a lot of, a lot of ability, you know, he, he runs well, um, he's got good football instincts, he's physical, um, you know, there's a lot of exciting things about him as a player, but once we kind of get him in, we'll see how, you know, his role kind of develops from there. And, and uh, I know he's on a good, good um, timeline to, to be healthy. Um, you know, we'll, we'll obviously be smart with it and, and everything. And he's worked uh, tremendously hard to, to be at a, a, a very good uh, level uh, health wise right now. 
Um, so, you know, we're, we're excited to really get him, get him on the team. When I look at, at roster arrangement, creation, drafting guys, where they get realigned, I think I fall into the trap a lot of times of seeing somebody who's uh, maybe an undersized whale or a Sam and thinking, well, they have to be a free safety because nobody's ever going to play a guy as a Sam linebacker that's a Canadian who comes in from the CFL draft because it just doesn't happen very much. Is that, is that true? In your opinion, when you look across the trends of the league and the way that drafted players end up getting transitioned, or is that just a creation of my own mind and I should just stop reassigning people to other positions? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, I, th- I think teams are generally pretty open to to trying people at different positions. I mean, it also takes, you know, the right player to do it. Um, but I think for us, yeah, we're, you know, we don't necessarily just put someone in one position category because they're Canadian and, you know, their body type kind of maybe directs them in that, that, that category. So I think we'll kind of see, you know, see what he can do and see what he can handle once he's, once he's out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to kind of see what, what he can do. I mean, we feel like, uh, you know, he can, he can um, still contribute, you know, even though he's, I guess, undersized, but still do some different things from a linebacker perspective. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then the the last one that I've got for you here on kind of the picks that you guys made is, did you imagine a world in which at the end of the second round, start of the third, you'd be able to go Dean Leonard, Muhammad Diallo back to back? Yeah, we didn't. um, We, we liked both of those players for sure. Kind of in the, the process, obviously. And, you know, we didn't maybe foresee that, you know, either of them would be there, just, you know, maybe one of them, um, just based on that they're, they're future type players. Um, but we weren't quite sure. And, and, you know, when they were there, we were excited. Uh, they're both, you know, really talented football players, yeah. um, you know, and yes, we have to, to, to wait for them, but, um, you know, if it, if it works out and, and we see them on our team one day, it'll be, uh, you know, we'll be pretty excited to have them. I had seen John Huffnagel say the thought was that because we have a talented 2020 class coming in, that maybe we would take three futures and we would take three guys, three bodies to bring into camp and the draft evolved and we took four and two instead. And did you guys build any plan around that? Was there a a consensus going in that said, this is what we want to do as an an overarching strategy of taking futures? Did that influence those picks of Leonard and Diallo at all? It's because it was such a weird draft from people looking on the outside in. Yeah, I don't, we didn't kind of view it that way, but we, we'd had our, you know, once we had stacked kind of our final board, um, I mean, it was pretty apparent we were going to take some, some futures. Uh, right. It was just a very future heavy draft, um, you know, and I think we, we do really like our team. Um, obviously you got to add competition to it through the draft, but like you said, we have another draft class. So, I mean, you just kind of foresaw, the league in general, like futures going a little bit higher this year in a way, um, you know, and, and there was just so many of them. So, I mean, we kind of anticipated that, yeah, um, you know, you, you would have, uh, you know, one or, or more that you draft. And taking it back beyond 2020 to 1918, uh, I have to ask you this just because I had the conversation with Kyle Mello here on Canadian Football Perspective the other day. We were asking each other because we genuinely didn't know the answer, and I don't think there is an easy answer, but I have to ask you because I have you here. If Mark Chapman comes in in 2018, plays in 18, or maybe comes in in 19 and gets to the Grey Cup with the Ticats and he's on the roster and he's a part of it, does Jay Bird still go first overall if Mark Chapman is in-house and already a part of the team? Um, yeah, that's a... Uh... I, I would think so. I mean, they're different, different positions and everything like that. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't think they're connected or, or anything like that. Um, you know, Mark's, uh, you know, he didn't, didn't end up playing for us, um, which uh, is unfortunate. I mean, he's a, a talented player and, you know, he's a great kid, great family and everything like that, but I, they're not really, uh, in my opinion, like they're just two different players and and different skill sets and everything so i I think it they you know both could be on our team you know really they uh they would have complimented each other pretty nicely yeah (laughs) um, i don't think there. yeah there's no connection in that sense at all 
And you guys still own his rights, do you not? Is the door closed completely? Do we know? Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't say. I mean, any anything can happen, but uh, it's been some some time now. So um, you know, I will. Uh, you know, we're we're kind of focused on on our season, upcoming season, and and, and really excited with uh, you know the players that we added in this draft, and and then even even the previous draft. Um, and then, you know, now the, the draft before that, too, the 2019 one, I mean, those players, uh, you know, some of them played and, and we were excited about. And I think they'll just be that much more uh, ready for once we get going again here. Well, I'll, uh, I'll stop making you look backwards. You can get back to looking forwards because I know that's what we're all yeah. looking forward to doing. Uh, Drew, thank you for the time. I really do appreciate it. And congratulations again. Like you say, when I... Every year, not just because I called games for the Ticats on radio and whatnot and because I live in Hamilton, but every year when I look at the way that you guys draft, I put up these mock drafts. I'm just throwing darts from 50 feet at a board and seeing if anything hits. And then the draft always ends. And my favorite part is not being right on any of these. It's looking back at the way you guys shaped it and going, wow, yeah, that made a lot more sense. Like, that's a really nice group that you guys have put together, and every year you guys do that. So congratulations, and uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing you down at Tim Hortons Field uh, sometime soon, okay? Yeah, no, thanks uh, for having me, and, and yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see you soon.